Hey guys, before this episode of Shutter Talk starts, I just want to apologize for the out of focus elements in this video. I accidentally put the video on autofocus and it was hunting for my face the whole time. So most of it is out of focus, but you still do have a good 30 minutes in focus. So I just want to apologize for that. If you don't like that, then go ahead onto Spotify and don't use the video version. Just use the audio version because on there, everything is good. The audio came out super clean. Enjoy this podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Shutter Talk. Today we have J- James. Is your name right? James or Jamie? I go by both. Okay, we're gonna call it. Which one do you want? Just Jamie. Okay, we have James on the podcast. Travel filmmaker. I met him around two weeks ago. Yeah, two three weeks ago. Two three weeks ago, um, at an event for Chio that we were shooting. Um, and yeah, he's a travel filmmaker, filmmaker, photographer, things like that. You know, the kind of people I have on this podcast. Um, do you want to introduce yourself very quickly? Let yeah. the people know who you are. So, my name is Jamie. I am 23 years old. Jamie from, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 23 years old from, uh, I guess, technically CARP, but I guess I grew up in Canada, oh, Ontario. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you mean technically? So, it's like I'm technically in CARP, but I'm not in the town of CARP. So okay, it's like you're the, in the region. Di- okay, district region, got but it. I'm probably a little closer to district. The details Canada. matter. The details matter. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> okay, you grew up. How old are you? And um, um, 23 years old. Okay. Um, at the moment, I'm, um, one of my things that I like to talk about is I have traveled to 30 countries across six continents. <laughs> okay. The only one remaining is Antarctica. Um, Do you plan to go to Antarctica? I plan to visit every corner of the earth. My biggest goal, my biggest dream, my biggest ambition. Do you think it's is, possible? Oh, 100%. Really? I, uh, my goal is to, um, and this is my first time saying it in a public forum, oh, is, really? to, <laughs> is to visit every single country on the planet before 40. Really? Every country. Well, did you hear about that girl? Um, Lexi. Yeah. Lexi Alford. You follow her? Yep. I, I saw it because I watched Yes Theory a lot. Yeah, yeah and me I too. Saw I'm that a bit yes, fam. Yeah, exactly. I saw that and um, that's crazy. What, she did it for 20 or something like that? 21. She's 21 you, years old. So you've done how many countries? 30. 30? 166 more. Okay. Well, let's go back first. Um, how was growing up for you? Is uh, You were a chill kid? Yeah, cool growing, kid. Up for, growing up for me was pretty... Uh, pretty typical Canadian life um, yeah Canadian life <laughs> big time hockey player so I grew up playing competitive hockey oh, my really? whole you life played a lot of hockey yeah so I were you I, ever good at hockey yeah I was pretty solid okay. like, I played competitively yeah okay um, I was a skilled center <laughs> I never played hockey bro I can't skate for shit but uh, yeah so that was like a big part of my identity growing up and then uh, as I got into my teens I got really into downhill mountain biking downhill mountain biking yeah so like going yeah, no, no, no like I know downhill it is. really fast, big jumps, like... I, I've done that. It's scary as shit. It's, it's like, one of the most dangerous... So you're, like, kind of, like, an extreme sport. Because hockey is kind of... An, it's Ho- it, Hockey takes a lot of balls to play. Yeah. Because it's it, so physical. It is very physical. And so, um, I took some of that sort of, like, mental skill and applied that to mountain biking. I would actually go as far to say that a lot of my career decisions were built upon my history of mountain biking really the reason that oh, I st- this is sick. no but the reason <laughs> that i say that is that if you are somebody that has done extreme sports then you know that probably 80 percent of it is all mental oh and i, I haven't done it but i 100 percent like when i'm trying to go off a jump and ski like skis yeah, there like you go. it's all mental because like if your mental is game is wrong then you're gonna mess up so it's like it's like it you takes so gut. much yeah like it's like like with the S theory, seeking discomfort. Okay. That whole sport is built around the uncomfortable. Yeah. So it's like you're looking and staring at this jump for the first time that you've never hit before, and like you think you can do it, but the consequences of failure are so high. Yeah. That there's like a big sort of X factor, like can I clear this? Am I gonna case? Am I yeah. gonna jump too far? Um, there's this like rock or tree to the side. What if I land fine and then go right into that? Like. Your mind makes up all these different excuses as to why you shouldn't do it, but eventually you just have to get to the point where you break through that barrier yeah. and push through. Yeah. And that is a lesson that I try to apply with pretty much everything since. And I think by completely immersing myself in an environment where every single day I'm on my bike and going through that sort of mental warfare, yeah. you get really used to the uncomfortable and the unknown. and that, when it comes to like things like like I know for you an example another thing that were similar is you decided not to go to school this year oh 100% I decided to leave and the year before that <laughs> so, uh, so for me I decided to leave oh really I was in university and I left because I felt like I was learning more outside of the classroom than within yeah 
um, which especially for content creation and marketing, I think is a very common path. Yeah. Um, mind you, I never viewed that as a risk. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people around me would be like, oh, I don't know about this okay. because the way I looked at it was like, getting a degree for me would raise my floor but not my ceiling. Explain that for me. So what does that mean? What I mean I've is like that analogy. So by raising your floor, it basically means like the lowest quality, the the likelihood of you getting a job, like the lowest quality of job with a degree, okay. would be higher. So it's like your than range, without. pretty much. Yeah. So it basically means, but the ceiling basically means like how far can you go, like how successful can you be? I didn't think it affected that. Yeah. So I wanted to bet on my ceiling as opposed to my floor, okay. if that makes sense. No, no, 100%. You could either have a really shitty job if you leave or a fucking amazing yeah, job. Yeah, it basically meant like the worst job that I could possibly get yeah. out of university would still be reasonably good yeah. if I had a degree. Okay. Whereas the worst job I could possibly get without a degree would be McDonald's. I worked at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so you can probably agree. Okay, but you were talking about the the, the, the getting out of your comfort zone, which yeah. is, it's funny, I've never heard someone have that mentality, but I think one thing too that I've learned is when you get out of your comfort zone is when you grow and yeah. you learn. Yeah. So I think that's just something to keep in mind, guys. Get out of your comfort zone, seek discomfort, join the movement. Okay, but let's move on. You're a big travel filmmaker. Yeah. How did you get into that? Oh, and also on the second note, when you were growing up, were you a smart kid? What did you end up going to university for, actually? Yeah, so I, uh, I'll i start with the first part of the question. Okay. So, growing up, travel, um, I come from a pretty fortunate family where travel was always like a part of it. Yep. So at 13, we went on our first Europe trip, which was about a month long. Yeah. By 17, I had done three Europe trips that were each a month long oh, and had wow. seen most of Western Europe. Yeah. Um, then we also did like a Caribbean trip, New York a couple times, and Florida, and so... I was already exposed at a very young age to quite a bit of the planet. To different cultures. Yeah, and to different cultures. And when you go to Spain or to Italy and to France, yeah. it's uh, they're they're very economically similar. Yeah. Um, maybe not quite as much as Canada, but oh, they're pretty similar. Very I was just similar. there for three months. And, yeah, no, you know, exactly. It's like it's fairly similar, but there's still you pick up on cultural differences pretty quick, oh, and that's beyond the yeah, languages. I agree. Um, and so I, I'm a very curious and extroverted person and growing up I was always just fascinated by learning more and because I had such early exposure yeah. to that it kind of was naturally there okay um, how I got into filmmaking was f f travel like video was always like a secondary part of mountain biking so if we really? were so it's from stem from the mountain biking so it originally but like for example um, you ski right yeah park Park skier? No, like you see, like I want to be a park skier, but I, I just don't have the balls for it. That's fair. I'll so be honest. <laughs> if, if you are a park skier, a skateboarder, a BMXer, a downhill mountain biker, a dirt jumper, a any of those, or parkour guy, like any extreme sport, filming is always secondary. Oh, 100%. Always. So, yeah. like, I don't care, even if you're like not that into filmmaking, you want to get the shot of you landing that sick trick or yeah. you hitting that jump yeah you know and you you watch edits of like professionals doing this and you get yeah, inspired yeah. by yeah, that yeah, so yeah. you want to make edits like that so it was never like a priority for me but we were always filming our biking because Damn. we wanted to get like our our initial dream was to get like sponsored and that sort of stuff and you the see, only I, way i'm just gonna cut you off for a second it's funny because yeah, yeah. After you said that, I've noticed a lot of people kind of stem into filmmaking like that. And I don't think I've stemmed into filmmaking like that. I was kind of like, I always, I never did it from another sport, but it's like Brian, for example, he told me last week that he got into it because of, um, dance, dance. Yeah. And he was like, I got to film this dance. Right. Yeah. And I think for some people it happens like that with whatever you're doing in the daily is not actually the main thing. Yeah. It's what you, you know, when you start filming it, which yeah. is funny. But sorry, continue. I don't so, know if you lost your train of thought. No, no, no. no. So <laughs> just carrying on. So mountain biking was kind of like my catalyst and yeah. first introduction okay. to it. Um, but I kind of put it on the side. Like I didn't really have it too much. And as I started traveling more, um, <laughs> yeah, starting to get a little chilly. Well, it just got the sun one way. But, okay. but uh, as I started traveling more, I started like just compiling iPhone clips and GoPro clips and making little edits. Really? Um, and Why that's, were you, okay, but that, the traveling, the iPhone clips, you were just shooting those for what? For Instagram? Or, yeah, or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. And like this is all around the time that Casey Neistat started okay. blowing up. Yeah, okay. And, uh, when he was like daily vlogging a lot, like 2016. Yeah, okay. Um, and so I started kind of getting into that. And then 
to kind of like pivot what really got me into um, filmmaking and stuff, like, I don't know if you saw on Instagram today, but my, my best friend passed away about three years ago. Oh, okay. And this is, I, don't, I want to preface this for anybody watching or listening, I'm not uncomfortable talking about this, I think this is going to actually bring a lot of value to anyone oh, listening. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, when that happened, um, I took a very, like, analyzed look into my life, because I, like, I going back to part of the question, um, you asked if I was, like, a smart kid and what yeah, university yeah. I went yeah, to, yeah. so I went to okay. Carleton, and I had, like, a, an entry-level scholarship, I was, like, a mid-80s student, yeah. didn't try too hard in school, like, okay. I, so it wasn't amazing, but I, yeah, okay, I, average, I never, yeah. I never struggled, yeah. and I did pretty well. Right in the well. middle, smack in the middle. Um, I did pretty well, very, ex- like, I was very busy, like, like, uh, co pres of student council, oh, okay. you're ultimate very, frisbee, okay. musical, hockey team, very like, did all that. kid, you're out there. Yeah, and so... When Dude, this... I see myself in you, it's weird, because <laughs> I was the exact same kid, except I didn't go to university. Okay. <laughs> I, I, sometimes <laughs> I wish I didn't, but... Um, and so, when this happened, I was in second year, and I was taking school very seriously. I was on pace to hit the dean's list for the first time. Oh, really? Um, and I... When it happened, it kind of really it shook me up so much because it was the first time in my life I, I just didn't understand what was going on, and you realize like what your priority structure really is. So at the time, I was like really focusing on making sure school yeah um, was a priority. And the second that we found out that he was gone, I was like, yeah, I don't, I I do not care about school because I'm dealing with something so much more significant yeah. in my life. So I ended up not studying for my exams. Um, my A minuses dropped to B minuses just yeah. because I, I had all the information I had was from before. Yeah. Anything after that I didn't learn. Yeah, okay. Um, and like some of my exams I like hardly passed. Yeah. Um, but it, it didn't bother me in the slightest. And later that summer, it was you, a big moment for you. Though. It was, it was, it, it was it the, changed the, the. It is the, the biggest course. is the biggest moment in my life to okay. change who I was. So I was like, I was a very lazy person before yeah. that um, because things like kind of came easier to me like I came from an upper middle class family didn't have to struggle for anything yeah. um, school wasn't too difficult like I wouldn't study too much and would still do reasonably well yeah um, and like a, it was just like a, an extreme amount of like fortunate circumstances um, until it was like the first time where it was unfortunate yeah you know and it's it was a the shocker first, it was the first bit of adversity that yeah. I had to face and so a few months after he passed we ended up going to Europe again um, and that's when I started picking up the camera a little bit yeah. uh, and filming that. And then about a month after that trip, I was asked to make a video to celebrate his life um, for one of the hospitals here, the Queensway Carlton Hospital, which yeah. is the local one, yeah. and for the Hope's Rising campaign. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Hope's Rising campaign is set to raise $5 million to renovate the mental health ward there okay, um, and to kind of improve the facilities there. And so... They asked me to make this film for him, and so um, myself and my buddy Ben, we put together some old GoPro clips, home video Snapchats, and made this yeah. video to his music and everything. And what that, it pr- that must have been hard. It it was, but it was incredibly rewarding. Yeah. Okay. Because I remember putting this together, and I was like, we. Like, my, my mentality, which I look is very filmmaking-esque, yeah. was, like, we are the ones that are capable of telling his story the best. Yeah. Telling who he truly was, like, outside of his mental illness, outside of depression, yeah. um, and outside of all that. We wanted to show, like, the goof, the goofiness, like, the, the true human being behind yeah. who he was. Yeah, yeah, So, we put this together, and it was, like, I, I felt so overwhelmingly proud of, like, what we had created and what yeah. we had done. And then when it premiered, I'm, I'm seeing people laugh and see people cry at the moments where I had, like, I was thinking about the emotions that I wanted to evoke within, yeah. within the film. And I was like, oh my God, people are actually Enjoy. feeling the emotions yeah. that I'm trying to yeah, yeah. have them feel. Yeah. And then a man comes up to his mother at the end and said that he put up his villa in Barbados for silent auction after seeing that video because he was so moved. Yeah. which ended up selling for $7,000. Wow. So we guessed that over about $10,000 that night was put into that foundation based on our video that we created. And that was like, that was the golden moment. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so this is what I have to do. If there's, if I enjoyed making this project that, this much, if it had this much of an impact, this is what I feel like I can do and like bring and share with people yeah. um, and tell stories. And then I knew that 
traveling in Europe for me was such like a, a good release of that, that grief and energy yeah. that I was like, okay, what if I put these two things together? So the next year I went to Chile with some friends and filmed all of that, um, which was amazing. And then I was like, okay, that wasn't enough. So then I was like, okay, like, why don't I go travel the world solo for almost three months? So I went to Southeast Asia and filmed, like, I think I put up 26 videos on my YouTube channel. Really? From that trip? During the trip. Oh, during, you're editing out there. I was editing on the fly. Um, and so the whole point of that was to, like, build a travel portfolio. Yeah which then led me to being able to pitch in Peru this June, being like, hey, here's one of my films from Southeast Asia, here's my Chile film that I made. Yeah. Um, I would love to come out and like film for your company and kind of start searching for them. And then I got agreed on my first sponsorship, so I went to Peru and all that sort of stuff. Wow. So, and even in Thailand, I was able to swing like work with like Airbnbs yeah. and different resorts to get accommodations and excursions for free and damn bro it kind of all spiraled like from like it started off as like a side hobby and yeah. like this little thing and then it clicked it was like the seed was planted within mountain biking yeah and then as soon as i went through um any bit of adversity and had to face anything difficult yeah it was like the thing that i clutched onto the most to get me through that and so now that's why i'm so passionate about combining the things that i care most about with filmmaking yeah Damn, bro, so, I'm speechless. That's thanks, like the that's like thanks, the long answer. Thanks to that. for sharing that story. <laughs> but uh, okay, thank you so much. We're gonna move on. Yeah, because I think we got enough information yeah, out there. But I, fe I felt like that was like the oh, long that was perfect. version. That was perfect. That was perfect. That was amazing. I literally was lost in thought. I was like, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this guy's got a nice story. Um, but um, so why travel filmmaking, Ben? Yeah. So. It's a different, like, you know, the, the, sh the, the video you shot for the friend was not necessarily a travel video, No, right? no. So, it was just, like, the combination of knowing how much I had already loved travel. Okay. And knowing how much I enjoyed filming. Yeah. And knowing that I could put those two together. Yeah. So, the first time I did go traveling after kind of discovering how much I really enjoyed video production. Yeah. Um, I went ham. Really? And I filmed everything. I was doing like all types of filmmaking. I was doing vlogs. Yeah. I was doing uh, little recaps. I was doing travel guides. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, I love every bit of it. Yeah. I was like, I love, I love the fancy like hard, harder to do and longer to take cinematic edits. Yeah. I love like just the like vlogging if I can. I loved making like the travel guides and like helping people out if they were going to a certain location. Wow. Um, Have you ever debated other types of filmmaking or it was, you, um, you never thought of, you know, corporate work? So like, I, I try to support corporate work and local work to provide for my yeah. ultimate goal, which is full-time travel filmmaking. Okay, no, well, that's how we met, really. Yeah, like, so it's like, I, I, I do enjoy it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, I could do it for a very long time. Yeah. But I know the thing that makes me feel most alive is going somewhere where I feel like nobody else gets to see and yeah. being able to tell a story being that able to you show get to it. know. Yeah. So, Damn, bro. Okay. Got it. Next yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you, so you've done it. How long have, then have you been traveling? Um, would so you say? I started traveling with my family in 2000. Oh, sorry, not traveling, just travel filmmaking. We're going to get detailed into travel filmmaking. Travel filmmaking, now. the first time I... The Chile trip, when was that? Uh, that was October 20th. That was two years ago. Two years ago. Uh, mind you, I pro probably my first one that I filmed actually was New York. Okay. Which was February 2017. Okay. So like two and a half years two ago. Two and a half years almost ago. three. Yeah. So it hasn't been too long. I didn't start the Adobe Creative Suite till January of 2017. Really? Yeah, so I didn't know anything until then. <laughs> it was kind of just like, oh, I want to I wanna dive as far into this as I can. Yeah. Um, and then I, you start, that was also around the time, like, it was only a few months after Instagram introduced 60-second clips. Okay. As opposed to 15 seconds. Oh. I, I don't think I even remember when it was 15 seconds. Yeah, so... When was this? I think it was 2016. 2016. It was, or 20, it was like story length, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so... Well, they're pushing towards vertical video now, is the thing. Or, yeah, with IGTV. A lot, a lot of video. And TikTok as I've, well. I've heard everything is going towards, as video content is beginning to get preferred, which is good for us. Yeah, I think I think, I think video is a very lucrative business. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Um, I think the whole media industry is a lucrative business, but specifically video, you have so much more flexibility with what story you can tell. Yeah. Because there's 24 frames in a second, right? A photo is one frame, so it's a lot more difficult. Not saying it can't be done. Yeah. It's easier to bulk create video, 
vi uh, photo, but at the same time, I think video can be more effective, more emotionally. Exactly. It's like if a picture tells a thousand words and yeah. a video tells a thousand pictures. Yeah. Like, you know? that's like, so, I don't even know the math on that. But, so, yeah, <laughs> but do you have any tips for people who are trying to get into travel filmmaking? Things that you've learned along the way? Yeah. So, if understand it's the first thing you have to know is, is self awareness. Okay. So it looks Gary really, v. yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it, it's true, but and I would, I would say this even if I'd never heard of Oh yeah, hundred percent. So. No, and the reason I say that is because you can go to Instagram or YouTube and you see these people that make really cool travel films and yep. they go to really exotic places and they, it looks really, really cool. Um, but honestly people, a lot of people just don't enjoy travel because there's so much shit that, that comes there's so along much with shit it. that goes down. Oh, it doesn't all go well. I saw a video recently. It was like the real travel like film. It's like, dude, you get stuck in airports. Yeah, you almost get mugged. Flights. You get you miss flights. It's, yeah. it's, it's a it's a fucking you lose your passport. Like, there's like so many stressful things that not just can, but like it's like it's like it will go wrong. Oh, hundred percent. You know? And you have to you have to prepare like like some very stressful things like going over your budget which happens a lot yeah it's very hard to forecast a budget for traveling going over that sucks and it's very stressful yeah um you know like losing something you care a lot about like whether it's like you lose your phone yeah or something or, or get stolen yeah um those things happen a lot especially on depends on where you go there's like a lot of negatives to travel but for me like the positives which is like getting to meet new people oh, and see yeah. new places and those experiences like you know i think you know what i'm talking about yeah. like those there's those moments when you're just like fuck yeah like like me and my cousin when we were traveling we would always look at each other when it's the moment we'd be like dude and then we'd describe the moment we'd be like we're totally in the euphoria. middle of croatia with yeah some, like i don't even i was like, in croatia this summer yeah, actually oh you were yeah i'd uh i was working, i was there too i was working with a company called go croatia sail oh really um and i was filming for like a sailing company and they did like sailing tours from like split to dubrovnik oh really and like go across the islands and stuff so i swear we literally met someone that i think did that tour we were hitchhiking a lot and yeah. someone picked us up and said oh yeah we just got off a tour it's pretty common like there's a lot of different companies a sailing like, tour yeah, yeah no it was something like that um craziest travel experience or um, multiple if you have some yeah so my my favorite trip ever was the one that i did solo yeah. i've done a bit of solo travel now um but the first solo trip which was to southeast asia for two and a half months yeah um i'll do two i'll do like the craziest yeah okay um and you can and even also do a like worst my, travel experience yeah like, so like <laughs> so people know how shitty it actually is sometimes to yeah travel. so but it's, it's good it's good don't worry <laughs> so there was one time last year and this is summer of 2018 yeah um i was in thailand i spent about 35 yeah, days in thailand in so many places <laughs> and uh <laughs> So I was at this beach called Rayleigh Beach. It's yeah. one of the most popular beaches okay. in, in Thailand. Um, it's one of those ones where you see like the beautiful like cliffs, like yeah. limestone cliffs oh, and I mountains there. Um, it's it's gorgeous. It's yeah. great. Um, and the sort of like strip in the town there, it's very uh, it's very like Rastafarian, like Jamaica, Bob Marley vibes, okay, okay, like a lot okay. of a lot of like weed shakes and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Um, and so I'm there, and a tropical storm rolls through. Like, full-on, like, just, it's pissing rain. Like, instant, or was it slow graduate? Like, <laughs> like, it, it, came like it hit pretty quick. Okay, okay. And so, uh... You have all I'm your with, camera gear? Um, I, I left it at the bar with some okay. friends. Okay. Um, and so I, I was friends with these American dudes who were staying on the, like, little resort. Resort in quotation marks. Yeah. This thing was, like, it was not that nice. Oh, okay. Um... Uh, but again, I was able to get, stay there for free because yeah. it was an Airbnb that I was like, I'll take pictures. And they were like, okay. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Um, Is that what you just say? You say, I take pictures? No, it's a little more, <laughs> in, it's a little more in detail than I'll that. I'll take pictures. Oh, yeah, here um, you go. And so this tropical storm rolls through, and I'm like, damn, like, I have to go to the bathroom, like, really bad. So I ask the lady who's at the bar, which is right by the beach, like, Hey, like, where's the bathroom? And she's like, it's actually down the road, like a hundred meters on the right. And I was like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. there's not one like here. So I, I thought to, like, it was illegal. I think so, in Canada you can't not have a bathroom in a oh, bar. This, <laughs> Thailand's a much different yeah, place. Yeah, Thailand is much different. And so in the in the middle of this tropical storm, you're in this little shack. I'm I have to like walk on the street, like soak myself, 
And I'm, it was I'm like, full on the storm. Yeah, I'm like, it's in the middle of the storm because I really, I really had to use. Yeah. And so uh, the road kind of split into this like Y. Yeah. And the left part of the Y was like the the main area, and the right part of the Y was like this like dirt road, which had this like big concrete wall, and behind the wall was the bathroom. And so I'm like, this is sketchy. I was like, this is really sketchy. So I walk in the bathroom. And in it immediately is this like 20 foot long hallway. Yeah. And at the very back of it are these like two Thai men. One is in like this like camo shirt and the other is like kind of like shorter and a bit chubbier. Yeah. And then like to the side there's like the like urinal columns. So I go into the urinal. Fuck. <laughs> and I hear the Thai men like talking louder and louder and louder. And I think to myself, I'm like, holy shit. There's a tropical storm, so nobody is on the roads. Nobody is, like, out there. Yeah. They are in this area where nobody can see me, nobody can hear me. Yeah. And they are tucked away so that the concrete slash brick wall is hiding me from view. And I was like, I am literally in the most perfect spot and opportunity to get mugged. Yeah. And I was like, and they're talking to each other really fastly, really quickly in Thai, and I don't understand what they're saying. I was like, fuck, I'm about to get mugged. Yeah, okay. And I was like, oh, I've had those very And so like, I'm like, fuck, I'm and I was so like, bad. and this wasn't me going crazy. I was like, no, like, this is like way too coincidence. Like, they're, they were like chilling there. Yeah. You know, like ready to like ambush somebody. Yeah, in the bathroom too. Like, and it's, and it's so tucked away and far from everything that I'm like, there's no way they're not trying to like steal some shit. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, like, I'm trying to like gear myself up. I'm like hitting my chest. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try and like bust out of here quick. And if I make it out, there's no way they can catch me. I'm too fast. And I was like, but if they do, I was like, I was like, I gotta, I just gotta, I gotta protect myself. And I was like, but I was scared. I was like, fuck, what if they got knives and shit? <laughs> I was like, I just, I, was, I gotta get out of here quick. So I look and I like peek through and I see the opening and I take one giant leap to get out of them, out of there. They're right behind me. Really? Yeah. And I like start walking really fast. I turn around and the dudes are like following me out of the bathroom. And I'm like, no fucking way. And I see one of them starts to run towards me. So I sprint, I sprint as fast as I Actually, can. Actually, yeah. And did you make it out? Yeah. I, the he can't catch me. <laughs> <laughs> so like tiny little short, like time in ain't gonna catch me. What the fuck? So, but you were, at least you knew it was gonna happen. For me, sometimes I just go in and I'm like, it's all right, it's fine. It's gonna be fine. No, and I but just here's, act natural. Here's the thing is like, the only reason I think I was able to get out of that without like losing anything or like getting punched or something because like i'm 100 percent confident that's what they were trying to do was oh, like rob me. especially if the guy's chasing after you after well, the, both of them were and so i was like okay so the reason why i was able to get out of that fine was because i've traveled enough where i'm wary of my surroundings and situations yeah and because i travel as a filmmaker most of the time i have like camera gear, a drone, yeah. a bunch of other things on me that are really fucking expensive yeah. that they probably don't know I carry. Yeah. So I always go under the impression that they may not know it, but I am a gold mine to yeah. rob. Yeah. I am the best person that they will ever fucking take stuff from. Yeah. I don't know if I can swear on this. No, no, no go ahead. Um, and so I was like, so I'm always like, even if I don't have my gear, I'm like always in that zone. Okay. And so I was like, okay. You're like, just always aware, really. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of mistakes that young travelers and inexperienced travelers make is just assuming that everywhere is like where they are from. Yeah. Which is like, just not yeah, true. No, no, you know, like people all. like, People will steal your steal your stuff. Yeah. You know, like your credit cards, your phones, like yeah. you know, and like sometimes people will be a little more aggressive to you than what you would anticipate. And yeah. You gotta be it's one of the negative sides of travel that you just really have to be aware of. Honestly, but for me it's funny because like I I do know that, right? So I'm yeah. always aware, but I for three months, like, you know, okay, the Balkans is not that sketchy, but like yeah. Bosnia, like, you know, you can get some pretty weird places and I, I think, think it Bosnia depends. Is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. It was amazing to travel to, but like you know, it's not obviously it's not the safest country. They have like three presidents or some shit, and they're in war with Serbia. Like not in war with Serbia, but they sell beef. Um, they squash. Him. I think you also have to be aware of what country you're in, especially like a place like Thailand. Yeah. You know, be careful. But then like in Italy, you know, yeah, there's still gonna be a lot. Like depending where you are, but at the same time, like it's a different it's a different environment. Yeah. So like you know, sometimes you know. For me, it's more like because I did a lot of hitchhiking, so this is yeah. what I'm trying to relate it to. Especially a situation like that is completely different. But like hitchhiking, like you know, sometimes you can trust people because like 
the country they're in, you're in is different. There's a little bit more faith than like a little more faith yeah. is what I would say. There's a little like obviously there's still a risk, but less risk than if I was you know hitchhiking in like Venezuela or some yeah, shit like yeah, that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I like I like to take inspiration from like different markets and niches. So yep. Sam is a big one. Um, I would also say Yes Theory is another, and yep. those are two very different styles of storytelling. Yeah, which I find really really unique. Yeah, um, I think. What I love, I love Sam Colder's execution the most. Yeah. But I love Yes Theory's messaging more. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, okay, like I'm not, like you take like little bits of your favorite oh, things yeah. from like each person to create your own unique concoction. Yeah. Um, as well as like, I try, like in terms of like gimbal use, I try to emulate what I used to grow up watching in mountain bike edits. Yeah. Because I used to see like cable cams all the time, which helps me with like drone work. And, yeah. And gimbal stuff, so I'm like, oh, okay. Like Sylvia Films is a really is used to be my favorite mountain bike edit uh, production company that I used to watch. Yeah. Like 2011 to 13, um, which at the time I didn't know I was actually like taking in the information oh, to like but, as in like a studying. That's sense. a completely different thing we can get into. So <laughs> people get it. People, every everything you learn in life is just stems from things that you unconsciously see so if you yeah. grow up for example traveling you know you're not conscious like yeah you, yeah, you it's know very you're on, subconscious it's very subconscious that you know you're on these trips and you find out oh this is what I want to do I've done this my whole life you watch a lot of movies when you're young you're like you should, even if you're not noticing you notice like you know oh the color things like this yeah. and and then you can later relate it and be like oh I remember I saw that movie you know oh I remember yeah, I saw yeah. these colors in, like literally colors in Avengers Endgame or some shit like that you but that's I mean? how creativity happens oh yeah it's it's through observations that you put together, and, oh, yeah. and because everybody has their own unique observations and outlook on life, that's how they all formulate and come into one. It's crazy, eh? It's really, There's really so many variables, but it's it's not even it's true. It's not even in film and photography. Yeah, I talked about Brian. Oh, it's everything. It's everything. Anything you do, the way you you know crush the the lemon when you're cooking. Like, yeah. Like well, like even going back for me like, with mountain biking, yeah. if I'm watching edits, I'm like, oh, I want to ride like him. Yeah. Like, I love his style. Like, I love how he, like, yeah. hits these corners and, like, rides these jumps. Yeah. Like, I want to look like that when I ride, yeah, too. Yeah, and yeah. so, like, you put everything together. And one of the things that... Um, do you follow Tom Bilyeu at all? No. So, Tom Bilyeu is uh, an incredibly successful entrepreneur. Um, uh, he has his own like uh, host he's the host of his own show on Facebook and uh, on like Spotify Apple Music yeah, called okay. Impact Theory um, and one of the things that he talks about a lot which I so vehemently agree with yeah. and I think anyone listening or watching this is like really friggin important to know and I think you'll agree with it a lot is that passions are not found and created they're developed and it's so it's like people always expect like oh how do I find my passion how do I discover it oh, well it's not wow. like you open up a box and it's there it's like it's a it's a stacking of all these different things that you've enjoyed over time the more you jump into the more it becomes an interest the more it becomes a hobby which eventually turns into a passion does that make sense no a hundred percent and I've never thought of that it's a very interesting point because I do agree like people are like you know how do, how do I find my passion like how do I love it and sometimes I don't like all things in filmmaking and that's the thing I like, agree you have to slowly go and do it more and more and more yeah. and more and more and more and I, I find I agree like nowadays like you know at, at first there were some things I hated but now like I actually enjoy I'm like damn yeah, and I'm gonna get this super nice shot you know like this yeah. nice backlit shot and you just enjoy the whole art of the that whole process the whole and process like and I think there's still much to go but totally like for me like filmmaking was very much box. developed <laughs> because it started as like a little interest to yeah. make biking look cool yeah and sometimes skiing look cool yeah and then it, it was like oh well, like let's make it travel look cool too and yeah. then it was like whoa wait i actually really like this and i've only been doing a little bit of it the whole time so then I, you jump into it a little bit further and it's like oh wow like i like this a little bit more than an interest in a hobby and then you start doing it more and more and yeah. it's like oh I think I, I'm in love <laughs> like <laughs> I like, think I'm in love <laughs> like content creation is my woman <laughs> okay um, but let's move on to the travel industry yes because it's a big thing I actually ask every single guest um, we can even say the whole creators industry but we're going to dumb it down to the travel this industry a yeah. lot of opportunity out there do you think there's a lot of opportunity is there a lot of yeah. demand less demand so um, explain your thoughts um, on that I think the thing, and anyone the watching thing. this, that bothers me the most, um, 
and a lot of people say it about the travel and tourism industry a lot, or any market in general yeah is that it's oversaturated yeah it's overcrowded yeah it is bullshit yeah okay there is always room for talent and here's here's an actual fact the travel and tourism industry is the second largest industry on the planet really out of all I don't know like are you sure a hundred percent positive I can't remember what's the most culture I thought was the second biggest I, Maybe I'm wrong, but it's, <laughs> it's big. <laughs> it's, it's massive. The, the point is, it's massive. Every single country on the planet, with the exception of maybe like two, yeah, like North Korea and Syria right now, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, depends on travel infrastructure and tourism to bring in economic value. Yeah. And right now, the easiest way to convince people to go to your destination is to show it off to the world. And there is no better way to do that than video. Yeah. The traditional media, which used to be like, you used to see like commercials for like Visit California or Newfoundland and Labrador on yeah. television, are now being done through targeted advertising, which is incredibly valuable. And because we as millennials, and um, in my case, I'm more of a zenial between Gen Z yeah, and okay, millennial, okay. millennials and Gen Z, we're probably the most, we have the greatest access to the rest of the world that there's ever been. And there's oh, yeah. a huge amount of like wanderlust. Like, you take a, an eight-hour flight and you're on the other side of the fucking world. Exactly. <laughs> you can get to any point in the world in 24 hours, yeah. which is an incredible thought. Yeah. Um, and so, we have this huge opportunity that many of us are actually actively taking advantage of. <laughs> this dog shut, <laughs> needs to shut up. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, because more Gen Zs and more Millennials are traveling, yeah. it means that there's going to be more money spent on the advertising and on the content creation and all these other things because that's where our eyeballs are. Yeah. And they're not leaving YouTube. They're not leaving as of late TikTok. They're yeah. not leaving Instagram anytime soon. Yeah. And so I think there's a huge, huge opportunity and abundance for thousands and thousands of more creators to come up and make careers out of it. Yeah. Because if they're truly passionate and willing to give value and tell stories and remain with integrity. Yeah. Um, I think those are really important. Um, it's just too big of an industry um, to say, to, to write it off. Maybe there's certain locations that are a bit more no, difficult. No, I 100% agree with that because the thing you said to start was the thing that hits me is there's always room for talent. So yeah. if you can do something in a different way, yeah. and you know, there's always a different way to do it, man. There's yeah. so many, there's un un untapped potentials every day getting, getting discovered. And exactly. And like, you don't have to be the very best in the world. Oh yeah. You know, like for example, if, uh. Let's say you're a hockey or basketball player, um, but you're not good enough to play in the NHL or NBA. Yeah. You could still make half a million dollars playing in, like, a European league. Yeah. Which is nuts. Yeah. Nobody thinks like that. Like, you are amongst the very best, but you're nowhere near the top, yeah. and you're still killing it. And yeah. I think content creation is going to be a lot like that. I think that. in anything, people always want to be at the top. Yeah, but sometimes there's you know, nothing wrong with being number ten thousand yeah. in the world, and you still make a huge impact. Man. Yeah, and there's so much opportunity, and not even that. Like once you hit ten thousand, and aim for ten thousand in the world, and then aim for the top. Like don't just go straight to the top. Like yeah, take those stack steps, your wins, stack your wins. Um, but we're gonna move on to the biggest mistakes that you've made that people should avoid. If you biggest. have made any mistakes, um, anything you've done wrong that you wish you haven't done, you know, reaching out for a for a I job think, or something just tips maybe like just general tips I think that um, people could easily make I think make. a lot of the mistakes that I've made and I've seen people make yeah um, have less to do with like technical things like what sort of pitches you're doing or like what sort of value you're providing or like what sort of content you're creating and more so to do with like the the mental and mindset side of things okay um, I think what often happens is like let's say you're pitching to a brand um and you just you don't think that you have enough followers yeah to, to oh, okay. no, I do something yeah. you know with them or to partner with them yeah. you're not going to work with them yeah you know but by getting into a mindset of abundance and knowing there is always value in content even without an influence yeah so if you can produce something that looks commercial grade quality that looks really well that tells a story in a unique way yeah Oh my gosh, these friggin' sirens. Dude, I gotta choose a different location for this freaking thing. <laughs> so many different things. But if you can if you could provide value to somebody in, in a unique way, it doesn't matter about your follower count. It doesn't matter about any of that stuff. Like, there is 
yeah. there is going to be room for that. Oh, it's not all that. You and can't so, base your whole business on your follower count. Exactly. Yeah. And I think people that... There's a lot of people, and I've, I've been guilty of it myself, is like you set yourself up for failure by not believing you are capable. And I'm a no big, confidence. I'm a big believer. If you if you genuinely think you cannot accomplish a project, yeah. say yes and figure it out. Yeah. Oh, really? Say yes and figure it out. Because those, even if you fail, you fail at the beginning. Yeah. You know, and you learn from that failure, and you are in such a mode of desperation that you have to try to learn something new to accomplish that task. Yeah. And I think the long term value of just trying outweighs the cost yeah. of failure. Yeah. And so I've turned Even then, down, failure is not that big of a deal. Just take your loss and you move well, on. Well, like, I've turned down projects, which now I look and I'm like, that doesn't make sense because, like, it was offered to film a wedding and I was like, oh, crap, like, I don't have a lav mic. I was like, I have a really, like, terrible camera set up. Like, it's not going to look good. Um, and, like, I lost $1,000 because of it. Yeah. You know, and I was like, what if, like, I kept that mindset going if bigger brands started asking me to do things, yeah. which I don't think I'm, like it's, like I'm not, it's not happening yet, but I think it will. Oh yeah. Um, and that mindset just doesn't make sense. If you say yes and just go for it and try to figure it out anyways. Yeah. Even within failure, you'll be better equipped to one up yourself the next time. Yeah. And you'll be more prepared to take on a bigger task. And I think just that sort of like fear of like saying I'm not good enough holds a lot of people back in this space specifically. Yeah, so what I'm going to say about that is 100% agree with you is that people don't go in with confidence and even I would say like for me sometimes when like there's certain people I'm scared to reach out to for a podcast because I'm like they're just going to say no, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that you should just just go for it and just send it. Send it because you know that but that's that's 100% what it is is like you never know what the alternative is going to be. You never know yeah. what's going to happen. So, like, you can't go back. Once you make that decision, you can't be like, oh, what happens? Like, for example, your wedding. What would what have happened if you shot that wedding? You know yeah. what I mean? And, and and reverse. Like, if you shot the wedding and you didn't, you would never know. So, just yeah. make your fucking decision and go. And I think the decision should always be opportunity. Take the opportunity to learn. And then if you fail, whatever. You're never going to see the fucking guy and, like, you know, you, you made yeah. the wedding. Okay, you made a bad video. You say, okay, I'm sorry. You're never going to see yep. that. Unless it's like a family friend. Like maybe, well, it's like, it, and if you really are that ambitious, yeah. you will not, you will not cry over that failure. Oh, 100%. And that failure will not mean much oh, at all to the rest of your career. Shit to the rest of your um, career. Like it's I such think, a micro thing. Like yeah. there's just so many creators that are too afraid to go after opportunities or take on opportunities because they just don't feel qualified. Yeah. Um, not knowing that just chasing that is kind of what the game is all about. And I think a big thing too in the creators industry is undervaluing yourself. Yeah. People are worth so much more. Yeah. But like people are like, oh no. Actually, that, I want to talk about that first. Yeah, Because okay. it's a very interesting topic because I was thinking about it a lot recently. Um, so there was a recent sponsorship I had in Peru with a company called Condé Travel. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like my first big sponsor. It was, um, I, pay, I paid for my flights but all my expenses were paid while I was down there. Okay. But I wasn't getting paid for it. I was being paid Four in excursions, activities, food, and, and travel costs in Peru. Yeah. Um, which was great. I still think for spec work, which for if you don't know what spec work is, it's kind of just like doing stuff to build your portfolio as opposed to make money. Never heard that um, term, but okay. I think, it was, I think it's like, uh, th I still think it was a really good thing. However, I made a film for it, which hopefully I'll be putting out soon. Um, and I, I think as of right now, it's my best work yet. Um, it's just, it's a promotional video for one of their tours called the yeah. Inca Jungle Trek, which I think costs about 400 US dollars to do for like four days. So it's not that much. Okay. Um, but the way I thought about it was like, okay, so they spent maybe like a couple, say like $1,500 on me yeah. uh, while I was down there um, for me to make this. Now, if they put this video on their Facebook, Instagram, and on their website, um, it's going to remain there, especially on their website to promote this tour for say the next two years. Um, and if that can lead to about 200 people in two years to decide to go with that tour, yeah. which I think is a very reasonable guess, yeah. that leads to $80,000 in revenue. Yeah, and they only gave you 1500 And that maybe took me like 10 days to film, yeah. and maybe like, it was about 30 hours to edit for like a three and a half minute film. Yeah. Um, and I was like, wait a second, you should not tie your 
value to the hours that you put in as a creator. Yeah. You should tie your value to the results that you will bring them. Yeah. So for me, is for example, if you provide eighty thousand dollars in value in a two-year period. Yeah. That because that video will have residual value. It stays there. Yeah, it stays yeah. on their website. <laughs> then why should I be charging anything less than I like seven, eight thousand dollars? Does that make sense? No, 100%. I'm, I'm, like, I'm going to write it down. Yes, but, it, uh, like your that 30 hours may only be like a week of editing, maybe even less, depending on like how hard you go at it, but that doesn't actually equate to the value that you're providing them. You're actually doing a big disservice to yourself yeah. and selling yourself short if you bill by the hour as opposed to bill by the result. Yeah. Um, so even for a restaurant, for example... Oh my god, if you this, do, is a good, this is a good topic. <laughs> if, you, if you do a campaign for a restaurant, whether it's photos or videos, yeah. and you say, I expect this to bring in a minimum of 50 customers. Okay. And if they know the average value that a customer or head at a table pays, yeah. then you can actually equate that to being X amount of dollars. Yeah. And so... Do you have a formula for how much then? It's basically just like... Take like, it, how much value you're gonna give them, and then minus what? Um, you don't, you don't know yet. No, just like just like come up with a reasonable amount. Like, okay. let's just say like 50 customers can bring in like two thousand dollars in revenue. Yeah. You know, and that's like you're saying this will bring in a minimum of yeah. fifty. Yeah. Two thousand, then sell it for a thousand. Yeah. Because and that's probably like a thirty to sixty second edit. Yeah. Um, that they may run ads on. Yeah. Um, and it may only take you like two hours to film and three hours to edit. Yeah. You know, so that's five hours of work for like a thousand dollars, which sounds like a lot because it is, yeah. but you're tying that to the result of what you're providing them as yeah. opposed to the hours that you bring. Yeah. Um, on the contrast, I do think it's very smart in the beginning to bill on a smaller hourly rate yeah. as you build up that portfolio and kind of like gain more This is clientele. for the more advanced people. Um, but as you start to become more advanced and get more clients and are at the point where you're turning stuff away, yeah. I think billing by results is how people in this industry make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and I think travel, going back to that, is where results are huge yeah. because people spend so much money on excursions and experiences. Yeah. If you go to a resort and you stay at a resort for seven, 10 days, and that resort is five hundred dollars a night, yeah. and people are spending money on booze, liquor, food, and spending. They could spend ten thousand dollars in a week. Yeah, you know, and so, and that, and if you're that's bringing one person, in, and that's yeah. that's one person or one couple. Yeah, and if you're like, okay, well, this this commercial that I'm making for you, I think can bring in five hundred. Yeah, that's when you're getting into like the tens and thousands of dollars within your budget. Yeah. And I think that's what's so lucrative about this industry and travel and tourism. That's an amazing point. Man. Is because people spend so much money oh, to get travel? out of Ottawa. Oh, <laughs> like, 100%. Like, like, especially like, in the winter. Yeah, no, the the, 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 day, the the amount of money you spend in a day when you're traveling is fucking like times like 20, yeah. times 30, times 50 of what you spend a day here. Exactly. But um, we're going to wrap it up. For sure. Um, camera setup. What's your go-to? I like asking this to everyone. Yeah. What do you use right now? And then also, what is your dream camera setup? So, right now, I am filming on a terrible setup. It's a Panasonic hey, G... Hey, man, it's not about the gear. It's uh, But I like to talk about gear. To an extent. <laughs> people say that, but to an extent. Um, so, I use a Panasonic G7 with a 14-42 to 42 kit, kit lens. Um, the G7 is like the sister cam, the GH4. So, not even the GH5, like the GH4 yeah. from Panasonic. Um, I can't even shoot 24 frames a second in 1080. Um, what can you shoot? I can shoot 4K 24, but it's upscaled 4K. 1080, 60, 28 bit. Um, so it's very low res. Um, it's And it's like the image is like, uh, there's no log profile, so I, I have like no okay. very minimal color correcting abilities. And it gets grainy oftentimes at about 400 ISO. Okay. It is the worst low light camera, which is why I say gear doesn't always matter. But there are certain times where it's like, if yeah. I'm bringing this to shoot like a DJ or like nightlife, yeah. I can't, there's oftentimes it just can't capture enough yeah. um, to bill higher rates. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter to an extent. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Like if you have a complete like, like ass piece of like gear, yeah, it's it gonna be bad. basically gear opens up the conditions that you I can shoot I think gear in. opens up higher, higher paying. Yes. 
I don't 100%. think as far as storytelling gear is yeah. out the window. You can shoot on your phone, like, and I'm I sure think that's especially better. personal projects. Oh, personal projects, yes, and, and just anything storytelling related is yeah. is is like that. And I think gear is 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 a money related thing. Yeah, if but you want to be able to get those higher paying clients, different locations that you're able to shoot at. Exactly. I think the last thing I'll make I'll, thing I'll say about gear is that. For personal projects, I don't think it matters what you're using because you can film whatever you want in whatever conditions. Yeah. But when clients have specific shots oh, yeah. and specific lists of things yeah, no, that they want exactly to it. get, that's exactly um, it. It, it does matter yeah. um, because it's like, well, if I don't have in-body stabilization, they want it to be handheld. Um, you can't that do that could, shot and that then they're not going to pay you. And, and then, and then it, it reflects on your rate and I'll... Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I use a Panasonic G7 with a 14 to 42 kit lens as yeah. the main, and a 25 mil 1.7, but it's cropped, so it's equivalent of like it's a micro four thirds lens. Okay. So it's equivalent of like a 50 mil, so yeah. I get a nifty 50. Okay. Um, which is it's nice for portraits. I really like it for like food, photography, and videography, yeah, okay. and it still looks pretty good. I love nifty 50s. Um, well, like I also use a a Zion Crane 2. Zion Crane 2. And uh, you told gimbal. me about this. It's too shaky or something like that. It's uh if you have like in body stabilization on your camera, yeah. Um, then you won't notice it much. Okay. But because the G7 has none of that, um, then you notice Why like does it little do that? I thought it was micro jitters. Really? So it's just little micro jitters. Is it because like, you used it so much, or is it, was it always like that? No, it's just, it's like, it's an okay gimbal. Okay. It's an okay gimbal with a not very good camera. Yeah. Um, which leaves, but if you warp stabilize it, yeah. it looks like totally normal. Yeah. So you can get past it One thing, easily. I'm just going to go back to the gear, but the thing is like, you're making like these, 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 these films, right? And it's yeah. all shot on this G7, right? Yeah. So I think you do get more opportunity, but at the same time, like, your gear can stretch so much further than you think, yeah. especially if you're 100%. in the right industry. Like, yeah, okay, if you're shooting clubs and you have a shitty shot, like, you know, choose the right, choose yeah. the right industry with the right thing to shoot. Exactly. If you're shooting a lot of low-light restaurants, yeah, you're going to need a higher ISO camera. But if you're, all you're doing is travel filmmaking, yeah, like there's this usually good lighting. Me. Yeah, because it's mostly outdoors. Yeah, exactly. Which is, which is why it's worked fairly well for me. Um, like, I could never be a concert photographer with my setup. Oh, no, no, you couldn't. Um, because the only way I can properly expose is with a really like low shutter speed which like if it's a concert everybody's moving yeah so your, your whole image is just going to be blurry okay but um, what's your dream, dream setup? setup dream setup Jinx. i'm hoping to invest in um and then the new year is a sony a7 III. okay i uh, love the you Sony. love sony's i love sony have you used sony's before yes okay. i've used the a7 III quite a bit yeah, well there's your um, low light solution <laughs> yeah uh with a the dream lens would be a 16 to 35 2.8 16 to 35 2.8 yeah they have um, that for sony yeah yeah okay so it's sony zeiss or yeah. no that this 2.8 is the the zeiss would be the f4 the sony g master lens is the 2.8 but it's it's like a three thousand dollar lens damn um well i have an 18 to 35 1.8 but that's also like a crop it's cropped yeah, okay so like aps-c yeah so this one's it. like uncropped so oh, it's okay. like hella wide yeah Hello and wide, especially hello. for those travel filmmaking. Yeah, sometimes and, you need that. Hello and wide. honestly, like a big part of travel filmmaking is real estate, hotels, resorts, yeah, yeah, Airbnbs. Okay. Oh, it's a lot of real estate. Yeah, kind of because leads. it's like if you want to offset your costs, yeah, um, get like a resort to pay you to do like a just like a simple real estate video of like their pool. Yeah, you know, or something, and like you can charge at least a couple hundred bucks for that, if not more, depending on, um, like oh, resorts have so much money too. Exactly. Um, so A7 316 to 35.2.8. Yeah. Um, I'd also love to get like a 24 to 1, uh, 105. Yeah. Uh, on that, just as like an all in one lens that you can do a bit of everything. Yeah. And uh, That's then it? probably like a DJI Ronin S. <laughs> oh, we're just throwing stuff out now. <laughs> well, like the, the, gimbal, the gimbal's got to be a part <laughs> of it. The gimbal has to be a part of it. 100%. So the, the Ronin I agree. S. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to finish up here. Thanks for being on the podcast. Um, anything you want to let the people know for the future? Don't be scared to plug yourself now if you'd yeah, like. So if you're if you're that kind of guy. <laughs> if you want to see my Instagram, it's at James Life. Life ends with an extra E, so L I F E E. I'll throw it up on screen anyway. Sweet. So. Thank you very much. Um, I think the last thing I'll say um, is I think the most defining thing in my life that I want to move forward with yeah. is I think time is our most valuable asset, um, especially as somebody that has experienced loss of somebody at a young age yeah you realize how we all have a finite hourglass yeah we just don't know how much sand is in it 
So I want to live every day as if it's empty. Damn, bro. Thank you for listening to Shire Talk. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Peace.